Hello, welcome to our webinar, How to Build a Successful RTI Program. We're delighted that you can be with us today. I'd like to tell you about our presenters and then they will start the presentation. We're delighted to have Trey Duke. Trey Duke is currently the coordinator of RTI and instructional technology with Rutherford County Schools in Tennessee. As the former principal of Smyrna Elementary School, Trey led the Title I school as they earned the status of Tennessee Reward School for exceptional student progress. He has presented in numerous professional development conferences and trainings throughout the state. In 2008, Trey was the Tennessee recipient of the Milken National Educator Award. We are also delighted to have Sharon Hofer. Sharon Hofer is currently the RTI instructional coach at Laverne Middle School with Rutherford County Schools. She is a former academic interventionist at Laverne Middle School. She too has presented in numerous professional development conferences throughout the state. In 2012-13, Sharon was the recipient of both the Laverne Middle School Teacher of the Year and the Rutherford County Middle School of the Year. And now, we will let them explain how they have built their successful RTI program in Rutherford County. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. We're glad that you're with us today. Again, I am Trey Duke uh, here in Rutherford County Schools. I work for the district office. You have my email there on the screen. Uh, feel free to reach out to me as we kind of talk today about uh, our process in trying to build a successful RTI program. Uh, I don't know if we'll ever attain the ultimate success, but we're definitely a lot closer than where we were. Uh, you also have my Twitter handle there, so if you're on Twitter, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. Uh, I love talking about intervention and sharing things we find there as well. And I'm Sharon Hofer, and I am here at Laverne Middle School, and we've certainly learned a lot in the last couple of years, so my email is there as well. And if you have questions, please feel free to email me as well. Okay, um, today uh, we just want to give you a little bit of history about Rutherford County and let you know that we are committed to ensuring that all our students are com provided with the timely and direct and assessment driven interventions to improve that every one of our students are successful. Uh, during this Lunch and Learn, we're going to detail how we systematically approach the blending of uh, PLCs and the RTI framework, putting those together. Um, to produce um, our interventions. We will focus on our time, our time on laying out the roles and responsibility of all our faculty members and how they are involved in the daily implementation of our RTI squared. Um, first of all, uh, we're going to explore the implementation and how we started off in Rutherford County Schools with the RTI program, and then we're going to connect that with how uh, the work between the PLC and the RTI, um, and then we're going to focus on the three key pieces to building a successful program. Yeah, so as we go through this today, just kind of know that, again, feel free to, uh, I know you can type some questions in and they'll let us know if there's any questions we need to address. I'm excited to be presenting with Sharon today as I get to work from the district perspective, but Sharon's doing it hands-on in the building every day, which is great. We are going to focus on those three key pieces that build a successful program, but first let's kind of talk about our implementation in Rutherford County. Whenever I present on RTI, I always show this cartoon. It's one of my favorite cartoons. And it's the two spiders building that web over the bridge. And he said, if we pull this off, we're going to eat like kings. And I remember when we started the RTI program in our district, we knew that this was kind of summed up what we were going to do. It was a lot of hard work, and people said we couldn't do it. Uh, but if we did it, and we did it well, then we were going to see a great reward for it. And we're, and we're really anticipating that as we go into another year of RTI and wrap up this year. Um, I also always start with this quote, and, and this is what I found when I began to look at implementing RTI from a district level, is I found this Marcus Buckingham quote, and I thought it really summed everything up. And Buckingham says that clarity is the antidote to anxiety, and if you do nothing else as a leader, be clear. I knew we had one primary goal, which was to build lots and lots of clarity among our teachers. 
when the state first introduced the RTI framework, uh, there was a lot of grumblings about something else from the state, and here's uh, you know another thing added to our plate. And I realized very quickly, it's not that we don't want to help kids, which is what RTI is about. It's that no one was sure how it would affect them, affect their daily life and affect what they were doing in the classroom every day. So I knew we had to build clarity, and so that's my challenge to you. The first step of what you're gonna have to do is make sure you're very clear on what expectations are, you're clear on roles and responsibilities, and your teachers are clear on what their role is going to be. That's the first step in making that, that transition as we, as we go to a successful program. We're gonna show you how we've laid that out in Rutherford County. If you're not familiar with Rutherford County, just to tell you a little bit about ourselves, uh, we're at 46 schools in the county, a uh, little over 40,000 students. 22 of us, 22 of our schools are traditional Title I elementary, uh, traditional elementary schools. Excuse me. 10 of those 22 are actually Title I funded schools. We have 10 traditional middle schools that run sixth through eighth grade. Seven high schools in our district. We have three magnet schools. We have an elementary magnet, a K-8 magnet, and a 612 magnet school. And then we also have three alternative middle and high schools. So we're a big district um, here in the county um, that we're trying to look at implement this in. One of the things we knew from the beginning is if we were going to implement RTI is to take a good look at the district initiatives we already had in place. We didn't want to throw everything out. We didn't want to say everything we've done is bad and now as we move forward, we're starting new. So instead we took the, the standpoint of what are we doing in our district and we need to build off of that. So what did we already have in place? We already had team structures in place. Every school had to submit leadership teams to our central office. They were required to have a leadership team. We already had student assistance teams led through our guidance counselors uh, to help identify kids who were struggling. And of course, uh, we're lucky enough to be in Rutherford County with MTSU and Dr. Aker, who's kind of the guru and, and one of the founders of the PLC process at MTSU. And he's worked close with us for years in the PLC process. When it came to our PLCs, every school already had scheduled intervention times. That was a guarantee that we had to make to our assistant superintendent and superintendent, that every school had time in their day where they were providing interventions. We already had schools having weekly PLC meetings, so the whole idea of collaborating around student needs was not new to our district. And again, we were already making data-based intervention decisions using common form of assessments. This was not new for us as we did the PLC process. I will point out we had a varying number of support staff in schools. I hear a lot about how do we make this work with the support staff we have in place. Uh, our schools are very different. We have Title I funded schools with extra positions, some that have the, the minimum, but we do have a varying number of support staff. One thing we were very lucky to have was already at our middle school, we had interventionists. Uh, we had this for years, uh, probably since I've been here in the county, we've always had uh, reading and math interventionists at our middle school. Now we did rewrite their job description as we went to RTI squared. We took a look at it, we asked them to reapply for the job because we were changing the job, but we really looked at how can we make this work by tweaking some of the job descriptions we have in place and adjusting those roles. We started last year, 2013 and 14, so that was when I first got left Smyrna Elementary School as principal and came to the district, and I was asked to kind of start the process for our district. We started last year by just piloting the framework in 10 elementary schools, three middle schools, and one high school. Now, I always put my caveat for high school in the fact that I met with them a couple times, but we didn't do a whole lot with them. <laughs> Uh, we did, last year we focused uh, on multiple day trainings for those elementary and middle schools that were beginning the process and we were asking to pilot. We really focused on that gradual release of information. Uh, with our elementary schools, I ended up meeting with them four times uh, over the course of the year for full day trainings. That was principals, uh, academic coaches, interventionists, math and ELA teachers. We did two days for middle school. And, and giving them the information they needed, we tried to avoid the fire hose mentality of just spraying everything at them, but what do they need to know and then what can we build on at a later date? We did training for all our SPED teachers last year, but our focus in all the training was this, that the Tennessee RTI framework can be viewed as a mandate or it can be viewed as what is good for students. And one of the things I always try and point out when I do training is, even if the state said, no, you don't have to do RTI anymore, 
that as a school and as a school district we would commit to but we're going to because really this framework is just what's good for students and I always say if you had a, if you, as a parent if you're a parent of a struggling student um, it's what I would demand from my kid that we identify deficits and we address those deficits in there so I encourage you to continue as you work with your district to remind them that this is what's good for kids Here's an overview of our timeline. This is one of the documents I'm happy to send. You can see last year what we focused. This year we are doing full RTI in all elementary and middle schools. We did not take the waiver for middle schools. Um, we are piloting in three of our seven high schools with uh, the tier three course code the state has provided, doing progress monitoring, working hard in those high schools. We focused our training this year on interventionist, uh, kindergarten through ninth grade, those that are working with our most at-risk kids. What kind of trainings do they need? And we really started uh, training high school teams, and we've done that this year. We've pulled in teams from every high school on the framework. So next year, our goal is that we'll have the Tier 3 course code in every high school in our, um, in our district, all seven. We'll have some experience with that, and we'll work closely with them. We'll continue to focus training with uh, middle and high school especially, and on, with our SPED teachers. Uh, it's getting ready for that 2016-17 full implementation in K-12 uh, when our high school waiver is up. So that's what we're looking at with our time frame. We've made a lot of progress uh, in Rutherford County. We've made a lot of gains that we're excited about and we're really excited to see how they correlate to value added scores. Here's one example of our movement. This was taken right after our winter screener. So this is first semester only. I don't have it for second semester. But as you can see, we moved large numbers of our kids, about of the um, right at 25,000 we have in K-8, moved large numbers of our tiered kids to less intensive tiers. So we moved 242 kids from Tier 3 to Tier 2 or Tier 1 in reading and almost 400 from Tier 2 back to Tier 1 in reading. So when you're looking at those numbers of almost 700 kids, 650 kids that in reading K-8 moved to a less intensive tier just in first semester and our math numbers are even higher with almost 630 kids in math that went from Tier 2 to Tier 1 and almost 360 kids that moved from tier three back. So we focused, we did lots of training, we worked hard, and we were excited to see the movement there. So that's a little bit about us as we kind of now move into what are those three big key pieces that we're gonna have to keep, keep in place if you're gonna have a successful RTI program. Yeah, we feel like the uh, three key pieces to building a successful program, first of all, is focusing on the long-term success. And really, actually, that should be a no-brainer that you're going to focus on what are the long-term successes for your children in your district. Also ensuring clarity for teachers, administrators, parents, and we don't have this listed, students as well. Um, making sure that the students realize why they're in um, the program. And clearly defining roles and responsibilities for everybody uh, in the building and for parents. Um, why should we focus on long-term success? When you look at the statistics, a student who can't read on grade level by third grade, four times less likely to graduate by age 19 than a child who doesn't read proficiently in third grade. And when you add poverty into that mix and the, the stats go up to 13 times less likely to graduate than his peers that have a little more money, um, when you add in 16% uh, of the students overall don't receive a diploma at all by age 19, but students who struggle with reading just in the uh, first few years of elementary school, they comprise 88% of those who do not receive a diploma. Those statistics alone tell you that RTI is needed. You know, one of, the, one of the things I always point out when I look at that data, too, is really when you're talking about a third grader, that's eight years old. And my, we can look at an eight-year-old who's not reading on grade level, and we can be pretty confident that if we don't step in and do something, they're not going to graduate, and the long-term effects that that's going to have on that kid as well. We know it's a problem. My wife was a middle school reading interventionist for a long time, and, and she would come to me and she said, Trey, I don't understand why we have these kids who have been in our district for so long that are still reading at the basic level. What are we doing to address those students' needs? And for a long time in many schools, we weren't doing anything to address those kids who were at, uh, the most at risk in our building. So also, when we're looking at um, their long-term financial wealth, 
uh, when households are headed by a high school graduate, a graduate, and they are going to accumulate 10 times more median household financial wealth than those that are headed by a dropout. Uh, college graduates accumulate 90 times more. Uh, that that's huge. That is huge. 63% of all job openings in uh, 2018 are going to require workers to have at least some college. And uh, when you think about if you can't read, how in the world are you going to be able to go to college? Um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics pro, uh, projects that the employment um, expected to increase by 20.5 million jobs from uh, 2010 to 2020. We're already at 2015. That's five years from now. And those jobs um, are requiring jobs that require a master's degree are expected to grow the fastest. You know. Um, while those requiring a high school diploma were experienced the slowest growth, what are these children going to do for a job if uh, they're not being trained by us now? Uh, one of the things that we do in our RTI meetings, I presented uh, Mike Matos when he did a book study with all of us in our district. He mentioned that uh, we are training kids today are educating kids for jobs that don't even exist today, that they're going to have jobs tomorrow that don't even exist. And a perfect example is a couple of months ago, this article was in the Daily News Journal about MTSU offering a new bachelor's degree in unmanned aircraft systems or drones. And who would have thought two years ago that this would even be uh, available as uh, much less as a job or as a degree at MTSU. Um, I wouldn't have, and when you read the article, and we'd be happy to send this to you if you ask us, um, there are so many aspects of this job. It's not just flying for the military, it's agricultural, it's uh, for Amazon, it's so many um, variations of it. And this is just one example of jobs we're training our kids for today that we couldn't have even imagined yesterday. So when we get back to why we feel like that first key point is so important is you have to focus on long-term success, right? Again, I think so many times in our schools, because of high stakes testing, because of the way uh, of accountability measures were handled, and again, I'm a former principal, I understand it, we focus on how, what do we do to make our kids successful for this year's TCAP? What do we do to make our kids successful until he leaves us in fifth grade or eighth grade and goes to the next school? Really the focus of RTI is we gotta step back and say, what is it gonna take for this kid to be successful in life? And are we doing what we have to have to make this kid successful in life? during intervention time. Because again, as Sharon pointed out, if our kids don't have those basic skills they need, we are knowingly setting them up for a future that they're not going to be able to live a life of prosperity and easy to find jobs. And these are the kids that are going to be taking over these jobs in our communities. We're setting up our communities not to be successful. So we know kids need help, we know kids need assistance, and we know in most places we have assistance in, in building systematically, and that's the special education system. And as a parent, I, as, as a parent, I would say special education is one of the programs that opened up doors for so many uh, kids in our community, in our country, to say we will work to provide every child with a high quality education. It's a great system and I have two boys and if one of those needs special education services, I will be that parent that demands that for my child, just as I know you would as well. But what we need to realize is that special education can't be the only systematic help our kids can get. And I think in a lot of schools when we look at what, are, what is in place so that every kid that needs help can get it consistently and systematically? For many people, special education is the only option in those schools. But we know that that's for our most intensive kids, that not every kid that struggles needs our most intensive intervention, and we have to have a plan. So really, RTI is about a way of thinking. The state has said it several times this year. I've really kind of clung on to it as well. And they keep saying that RTI is not a new program or initiative, and they're not. RTI is about how we think about student learning. There's kind of two trains of thought there, right? That if a kid's not making progress, that first of all, there's something wrong with the kid, and so let's put him in special education, or let's, let's give him something that will help him because there's something wrong with him. 
or if a kid's not progressing, our other thought is we haven't filled in the holes we need to and we need to try something else with him. So when I look at RTI, I think about it as how we think about student learning. That if a kid's not showing progress, our first question is not what is wrong with this child. Our first question is what have we provided or not provided to meet this kid's needs. Rick DeFore sums it up. Well, first, let me say, uh, Sharon mentioned Mike Matos. Uh, this is a great book. I highly recommend. It's kind of been a cornerstone for us in our district, which is simplifying response to intervention. Uh, Buffalo, Matos, and Weber lay out what are those guiding principles, and it's a great read for those of you that are interested. But I like what Rick DeFore says, right? He says, don't tell me all kids can learn. Show me what you do when they don't. And to me, that is the epitome of your RTI system. If you want to do a really quick, fast evaluation of how RTI is going in your district or your county, ask yourself this question. When kids don't learn, what can you show me? Where can you take me? Um, is special education the only place you can take them? Then that may be your RTI system. Or can you take us to intervention classrooms, take us to team meetings where teachers are talking about data? What you can show us, that is your RTI system. I always say if you polled 100 teachers and you asked them, do all teachers, do all students learn the same way and at the same time? 100% of those teachers would say, absolutely not. We know that kids learn differently. We know that kids don't learn at the same speed. So my response is, so then how, what are we doing proactively to make sure there's something in place. If we know they're not going to learn the same speed and we know they're not going to learn the same way, what are we doing proactively to help them? So again, RTI is not about a program, it's about how we think about student learning. So we knew we had to provide clarity. We focused on long-term success. That was our step number one. We tried to make sure that we changed the way people thought about RTI. Our second step there is, is providing clarity. Um, and again, we our big theme is clarity before competency. If we want our teachers to be competent in what they're doing, then we have to be crystal clear about what the expectations are. So quickly, we're going to go through a couple points in our district that we had to clarify, that we had to make sure everyone was speaking the same language. And when you're talking about doing that for 46,000 students in 40, uh, I'm sorry, 42,000 students over 46 schools, that's a big job providing clarity, but it's an essential job. Okay. Um, RTI squared. When it first came out, everybody wondered, what is RTI squared? What does that squared mean? It's instruction and intervention. And the most critical part for student success is the fact that every single child gets tier one instruction. Nobody misses that. You don't go to intervention and miss tier one instruction because it's essential for kids to be successful. Core classes meet and exceed the grade level uh, Tennessee state standards. That means they are rigorous. They are uh, meeting what each child needs. Uh, tier one includes and relies on differentiation and flexible small grouping. Uh, even your kids that are excelling are in flexible small groups to excel even more. All students are tier one students first. And let me say that one more time. All students are tier one students first. That's really a, an important part to talk about and clarifying with our teachers that RTI does start with tier one instruction. We had to fight the notion that uh, tier two and tier three kids were not my problem. They, they, they go off for intervention and they, and they handle that in intervention. But really, as Sharon's pointed out, we can't replace good first teaching with interventions. And so we have to get it right the first time. So our slogan has been the first day of school in August when they walk in your building, in your classroom, that's when RTI begins. And we're going to build off of it, but it begins there. Other things we had to clarify is that RTI is not about a roadmap to SPET. And for a long time in our district, this was the understanding that we do RTI simply for the, for the purpose of putting kids in special education, which is not what we want to look at. We even know the federal law that, um, federal law that mentions RTI squared says it can be used for two areas. It can be used to certify kids for learning disabilities or prevent learning disabilities. My kind of challenge to my schools has been your school can't view it both ways. Um, either you're doing RTI to certify kids for learning disabilities or you're doing it to prevent. Now, even if we're doing it to prevent, you're absolutely right. Special education may be a byproduct of that. But again, it's about a frame of mind. Our goal is to be proactive. 
the first one about certifying kids for learning disabilities puts the focus on the students and what they can or can't do. The second one, when we talk about using it to prevent disabilities, we turn that around to ourselves as a teacher and we say, what else can we do to help this kid? What else can we do? And I think it's one of the reasons we've been so successful. We really wanted to clarify where RTI fit into the PLC process because that was a, a big initiative for us for many years as PLCs. And always we wanted to continue to clarify what's the difference between a standard-based and a skill-based intervention. And the fact that almost every kid in our district is going to need some type of intervention, the question is what type of intervention do they need, all right? So how does it fit with the RTI process? Again, it's that next logical step in the implementation of PLCs. If you're meeting as a team, if you're looking at data together as a team, that next step should be how do we address the needs of our students? And I'll say it, um, say it confidently that really the success of RTI depends on the success and fidelity of your PLC team. If, you're, if you have a building where your PLC teams are not working to discuss collaboratively student needs, that's not going to start just with the implementation of a state initiative. You're going to have to build that from the ground up. And when we look at those four guiding questions of a PLC, that third one, what will we do if they do not show mastery? And the fourth one, what will, how will we enrich the learning for those who are showing mastery? That's what our focus is in RTI. Okay, when we talk about proficiency on TCAP, um, the state says that uh, Tier 1 remediation that every child needs intervention, just as Trey just said, and it just depends on where we're going to put that. Well, the state says that RTI starts at the 25th percentile and down for Tier 2 and Tier 3, but we know that we don't want to forget those kids that are above the 25th percentile, that they're going to need interventions as well, but they come out of your Tier 1 classes and they're standards-based interventions and they're based on they come through your PLC essential skills and they're based on benchmarks and common assessments that are um, processed through your PLCs. So I'll, and, and just to kind of continue to clarify on this model it's what we've used and as Sharon talked about the state framework again there are specific guidelines we have to follow for the 25th and 10th percentile kids and we know that Sometimes, since that's where the requirements are, there may be that, um, that urge to focus all of your attention there. We knew in Rutherford County that the majority of our kids were falling right here. They weren't proficient on TCAP, but they were above the 25th percentile. So we had to make sure we were clarifying these students are needing standard-based interventions. It's not that they're needing basic skills. They need help, but they need help that looks a little different. And, and as Sharon said, that's building off the work of the PLC. Yeah, above the 25 percentile, the PLC is going to take the lead on those children. They're going to intervene and they're going to reteach those essential skills. They're going to pull them into those small groups uh, based on the common assessments. Um, those um, common assessments are going to be used to identify which kids are needing, and those are going to be fluid groups. They're not going to stay the same. Um, there's no need uh, to progress monitor these kids like there is with the 25 percentile and down. There are no time constraints as there are with Tier 2 and Tier 3 kids. And uh, it will all be driven by the PLC team. And they'll be on grade level. That's something that, that needs to say. That was something in the very beginning was a little unclear as we were being a pilot school. This is grade level standards-based interventions above the 25th percentile. And this is another, um, if you don't take anything away from what we say today, but Tier 1 instruction is the most important <laughs> uh, thing, and by student, by standard. That's what we live by in our district. Yeah, and it's so important when we look at those that, again, we clarify that we do have a large percent of kids above the 25th percentile who need interventions. We're not going to stop giving interventions to those kids because we don't have to keep required paperwork for the state for them. We have to continue to do it, but that intervention needs to look different. And so that's when we say roles and responsibilities, standards-based intervention, that is the focus of the PLC team. That's what they're working on on a daily basis. Picking essential standards, giving common formative assessments on those essential standards, and then intervening as a team on those essential standards for those kids. And we might want to add, Trey, that the kids that are in that 25th percentile in the uh, Tier 2 and Tier 3, they're also getting standards-based interventions. Just because they're below on uh, 
the TCAT, they're still getting standards-based interventions. And, and what we say is it's just not the first priority. Time. Yeah, it's a different time. It's not yeah. their first priority. For our kids who fall below the 25th and 10th percentile, our first priority for them is interventions that are based on their most basic skill level deficits. Right. This is where the state framework kind of pops in and really says, hey, we need to identify our struggling kids and figure out what is it that they're missing. One of the issues we ran across in our district, and again, clarifying that maybe you dealing with as well, is that 100% of our interventions were standards-based. It didn't matter if you were at the 80th percent, uh, the, sorry, the 50th percentile and just not proficient on TCAT, or if you were at the 5th percentile, you were getting interventions on those standards. And we had to take a step back and say, wait a minute, for our lowest kids, we have to realize that the issue and why they're not doing well on their eighth grade math uh, common formative assessment is not that they're struggling with fractions in the pre-algebra they're working on. The reason that they're struggling is they're missing basic number sense, and they have huge holes off grade level that we have to go in and fill first. So we want to make sure we're clarifying that kids at different areas need different interventions, and we have to plan for that. So, of course, you've seen this with the state framework. These are what we talk about when those, those skill-based um, interventions look like. We try and hold very close to this and, and identifying for kids. Is it that basic reading, their fluency or comprehension, that's keeping them from accessing uh, tier, inter, uh, tier one instruction, or is it calculation, problem solving, or written expression? But what is that basic skill they're missing that's being the stumbling block uh, for um, them to access those tier one standards and it's really important we look at that. So we knew we had to then say okay our step number one was to focus on long-term success. Our step number two was to clarify some really important key points for our district. And the third thing we had to do was if this was going to work, we had to divide out some responsibilities of who was in charge for what. So what we did is this actually came from Mike Matos's book that we shared earlier. Uh, I liked it a lot because, again, it's the inverted pyramid, just like the state uh, model is. You'll notice that there's two colors there. There's the darker gray and the light or gray. And what we said is, and what Matto says in his book, is there are certain responsibilities at Tier 1 and Tier 2 that's the responsibility of the PLC team. They take the lead on that. So if we're talking about an 8th grade math PLC, there are certain things at Tier 1 and Tier 2 that they're going to take the lead on, that they're going to take the charge on. No, it doesn't mean the administration's not involved. It doesn't mean the academic coach isn't involved. It just means who's in charge of this, who's leading it. And it's important you clarify that. Uh, again, one of my favorite quotes, when everyone's in charge, no one's in charge. So we have to make sure we know who's taking the lead. There are also some things that need to be the responsibility of the school-wide intervention team. We had leadership teams. We've had student assistance teams. Uh, we've kind of renamed them to be RTI squared teams because that encompasses Tier 1, Tier 2, and Tier 3. But there are certain things in the RTI process that is the responsibility of the school team. In other words, this affects our most at-risk students, and it didn't take someone from every uh, part of our leadership team to, to give input on this because it affects multiple areas in our building. And so let's clarify who is in charge of what. Now I'm going to specify before we jump into this, um, this is designed, this model I'm giving, what we did is I took the state framework, and I took the state framework and I kind of sorted it out in this pyramid to look something like this. And again, I'll be happy to send this to you and created this graph for our district on who's in charge of what. This is specifically the one I'm showing you right now, the elementary one. I have a, a different one for middle schools, um, and the content we'll talk about focuses on elementary and middle. And uh, as we get ready for high school, I've just recreated another one for high school. Let me point out, high school RTI, there are a lot of the components that are the same, but it is different. So if you're out there and you're in a high school, I always say if you ever are in a training and they say I, high school RTI and elementary RTI are exactly the same, you need to leave because they're not. High school RTI is different. Um, and I'm happy if you want to talk about high school RTI, reach out to me. Um, I think it has a lot of power, and we're doing some good work around high school. But because of the, just the time constraints today, we're going to focus on elementary and middle specifically. So we took our chart, we took the framework, and we put it in here, and we're going to kind of break down those roles and responsibilities quickly. Okay, the RTI squared team at, uh, at my school is led by me. And the members of that are uh, like my guidance counselor, my admin, 
Uh, our uh, my interventionists are on that team. I have SPED uh, teachers on that team. I also have my school psychologist, and we have classroom teachers on that team. And we meet every four and a half weeks and discuss um, the status of the children that are in intervention or other uh, students that may need to come into intervention according to either benchmarks that they're taking in their classroom, they begin to struggle, or uh, from their the universal screener. Um, part of that is uh, of our meeting is ensuring that uh, interventions are being implemented with integrity. Uh, we review and discuss the student data and their attendance and uh, their engagement in their in the intervention uh, classroom. And we're keeping parents informed. Uh, we're sending a letter to the parents uh, with their progress report or uh, in between times if it's uh, needed more often, but the parents are being informed every four and a half weeks. So what we're going to do now is let's take each tier and, and show you how we broke down this in Rutherford County, how we divided tier one, tier two, and tier three into what the PLC team leads and what the school-wide intervention team leads. And we'll start with tier one. Sharon, why don't you talk to us about what, what is the responsibility of the grade level PLC team in tier one instruction? Okay, they're going to ensure that the core classes are going to meet or exceed uh, the Tennessee state standards. Basically, what teachers do every day in tier good, strong tier one instruction. Uh, they're going to differentiate their instruction and make sure they're meeting the needs of all their children uh, in their classroom. They're going to identify those essential standards uh, for every course. Um, they're going to have common uh, formative assessments that are given across the grade level. And they're going to identify those students that are either in need of remediation or enrichment based on those common formative assessments. And I think what Sharon said was so important about that good, strong Tier 1 instruction. Again, our theme has always been RTI starts with Tier 1. We, and and I, I'll use the quote that if, you know, the statistics will say if 80% of our students should be able to be successful at tier one with good strong tier one. So if 80% of our kids can be successful there, then shouldn't the majority of our resources go to making sure we have the best tier one we can possibly have? And we want to make sure we do that. So we, the, when, and also when Sharon talks about identifying students for enrichment and remediation, we're talking about those above the 25th percentile kids, those kids that didn't qualify for, um, RTI under the 25th percentile, but they still need help. That PLC team leads that at Tier 1. So what's the school-wide team do at Tier 1? Remember, they're looking at that school-wide approach. First of all, they have to ensure that there's universal access to grade-level standards, right? Instruction and intervention. That means we're going to have to be very purposeful about our master calendar and our master schedule. Can kids get Tier 1 English? plus uh, reading, uh, uh, reading intervention. Can kids be in their tier one math class plus a math intervention class? They're also making sure that those minimum instructional times are provided. And again, creating that intentional schedule. I always joke when I started teaching, you know, every teacher just kind of got to make, I was an elementary teacher, we made our own schedule. Here's when we're teaching it, we handed it in. When you're looking at an intervention program, you have to be intentional to make sure every kid gets what he needs to get. So that takes a school-wide schedule. And finally, we call them RTI coaches. You may call them academic coaches. You may call them lead teachers. Uh, they're going to work with those tier one teachers and basically that peer modeling to make sure that the fidelity of instruction and best practices is happening. Again, putting our resources back into tier one. Sharon talked about providing differentiation at Tier 1, because here's the thing, if we're going to say our Tier 3 kids have to be in Tier 1, then we have to make sure our Tier 1 teachers are giving differentiation for them so they can access that material. So we tried to scope that for Tier 1, here's who's in charge of what. As we move on, we did the same thing for our Tier 2. When we talk about our PLC team, Sharon's going to talk about uh, what we asked them to do. Once again, and we use that word essential work of the PLC, and it absolutely is essential. Providing the standards-based interventions for not showing mastery on common formative assessment. If your child in your classroom is not showing mastery, why are they not? Does it need to be retaught? And who needs to reteach it? If it is that same teacher going to reteach it, or are you going to combine those kids in another way, regroup them where another teacher teaches it? Uh, providing enrichment for students showing mastery, you know, um, bumping it up that level so those kids are able to go to that next level up. And remember, there's no time or data minimums for students, um, so they can be in those enrichments or those um, 
those classes where they're getting that intervention uh, one time, two times, or maybe five times if that's what's needed. Yeah, and it's a really great point because, again, once we hit to those kids below the 25th percentile, we know there's some minimums we have to meet for the state and based on best practice at how long a kid needs to be in intervention. But let's not confuse kids below the 25th percentile with kids above the 25th percentile. You know, you may have a kid who's been out for a week and you pull him for two days for standards-based intervention. He's going to get it. He's ready to go versus a kid that has a major skill deficit and we have to keep them for, you know, until we have enough data to show that what we're doing is working. Really important work going on there. So while the PLC team is focused on those kids above the 25th percentile, they're looking at that data, they're making those groups, and they're providing that intervention for them. The school-wide team is really focusing on kids below the 25th percentile on the screener. And, and they're struggling academically, right? And the school-wide team is making sure that we're using research-based interventions on that specific area of deficit. It may mean that we're stepping off grade level, we're going back a couple grade levels, but we're not focused on specific standards anymore. We're focusing on those skills and we're going to make sure they're skill-based. I'll tell you, that's a real challenge. The higher you get, it's easy to tell a third grade interventionist or a teacher doing third grade to, to focus on those skills, when you get to an eighth grade teacher and you're trying to tell her, hey, don't teach your eighth grade reading standards during intervention time to this group of kids, let's go back and teach them some basic fluency and comprehension activities, that takes some training there and we, you have to work with them to do that. Of course, that school-wide team is going to make sure that we have a schedule that allows for 30 minutes of intervention in addition to Tier 1. And that all-important part of fidelity monitoring, when I first started the whole RTI uh, work in our district. Fidelity monitoring was something I kept trying to push off. It's now something I cling to as the one of the most essential parts. We have to monitor ourselves and say, is what we're doing working in the classroom? And it's really critical. I will say at Tier 2, none of this can work. The school-wide part for our kids below the 25th percentile or the PLC work if you don't have that built-in intervention time every day for your kids. Finally, we'll look at Tier 3. At Tier 3, you'll notice there's just one column, right? And we put all this under responsibility of the school-wide intervention team. Again, that doesn't mean that the grade level teacher has nothing to do with the Tier 3 kid, because they do. They're in their class for Tier 1, they're working with them, but they don't take the lead. The school-wide team takes the lead to make sure that, first of all, we've identified kids below the 10th percentile, that we work with whoever's providing interventionists to make sure they're doing something that's more intensive than what they got in Tier 2, whether that's a smaller group or a different program. We have to continue to ensure at Tier 3 we're giving them skill-based interventions, and Sharon might step in with her team and say, we need to do some additional assessments on this kid to figure out why is it that he's still not making progress. We want to make sure we have a schedule that allows for 45 to 60 minutes. Schedules are always the tricky part. It can be done. We can create schedules where our kids can get Tier 1 plus interventions and make that work. We want to continue to fidelity monitor them. And most importantly, we want to make sure our Tier 1 teacher has the information needed to differentiate so students can access Tier 1. And that's really the responsibility of that school-wide team. You may have a that 8th grade math teacher that that um, doesn't do any of the interventions, but that tier three kid is in her classroom. She needs to know what that reading level is. She needs to know what he's working on intervention so she can build off that in her class and not expect him to do something that we know as a school he's not ready to do yet. So really that's the third piece as we look at all this. We started by making sure we focused on long-term success for kids. We then clarified some key points about RTI and then we tried to lay out specifically who was responsible for what? And in 40 minutes, we tried to give that to you via webinar as kind of the starting point for us of what you're going to have to do to kind of build that program. But finally, I'll end with this. We really have to determine it. You have to set your mind on what's your goal for your kids. What is the goal you want for your kids? Is it that you want all kids to learn at high levels or you want all kids to learn at high levels? the first time the material is taught. And if your expectation is that we're all going to learn at high levels the first time the material is taught, you don't need RTI, right? You either do it or you don't. But if your goal is that all students will learn at high levels, we have to have a system in place proactively to know when they don't show um, mastery, what are we going to do for those kids? You know, um, Mike Matos, he has a um, 
a quote, if we fail at implementing RTI, we're not the ones who will pay the price. The kids have dreams. Um, this to me is a very haunting picture. It comes from a book um, about kids falling through the cracks. And I, I really truly can't get it out of my mind. And we don't have kids falling through the cracks at our schools anymore. And for me, that has been the most rewarding thing about RTI in our schools. And for the people who say, oh, it's another initiative, it's going to go away, it's RTI, you know, it's, it's one of those things. Well, if it does, what a shame, because RTI should be here to stay. Because our kids, we see growth, we see our kids gaining confidence, we see kids that are feeling good about themselves now, and they're not falling through the cracks and sitting under those boards like these children here. So again, really it starts, as Sharon said, it's just th changing the way we think about student learning and whose responsibility is it to make sure students learn. If our focus is it's the kid's responsibility, then you don't need RTI. But if we're going to say it's our responsibility as educators to make sure every kid learns at high levels and every kid has what he needs, then we're going to have to take a good look in the mirror and say, what else can we do as 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 teachers to make that happen and what can we set in place to allow that to happen from our schedule to how we uh, clarify our duties. So at this point we're going to turn back over to you Bethany uh, for any questions that you may have uh, and again there's our contact information you can contact us there as well. Okay I only have um, two questions. The first one was what percentage of the students in Rutherford County are the tier two or tier three students? I'm sure that's uh, it, different from county to county. Yeah, so it's different. We strive to hit, um, it, it depends. The last district numbers I ran, we were pretty close to about 5% being in Tier 3 and about a little over 10% in Tier 2, which is pretty good for us. We have a very large district with uh, some very high-need schools, so it fluctuates from school to school. We have some schools that are as high as 8 or 9% of their student body in Tier 3, um, and some as low as 2 or 3% because of the socioeconomic status of those schools. But as a district, we are right around that 5% mark um, that we're looking at. I'll also say in some schools, we've had to use those relative norms the state talks about. Uh, we couldn't serve all the way up to the 25th percentile because we just didn't have enough hands and because of the needs of that building. So maybe we're only pulling the, the bottom 15% and doing more in tier one to address those other needs. Okay, I just got another question that popped up. Um, what research-based programs are you using? Uh, so we're using several different research-based programs uh, to kind of look at it. I'll be honest, one of the things we've steered away from as a district is saying, here's the RTI program. I think one of the big pitfalls in a lot of things we do is we hand out a program and we say, this is what you need to use in Tier 3, and all of a sudden Tier 3 is not about figuring out that kid's strengths and weaknesses. It's about implementing a program and that's it. And so we, we try to be very careful with that. We have provided some examples. We, our other motto has kind of build, been to let's build better teachers. So we've sent a lot of teachers through trainings through Orton Gillingham, uh, through Reading Recovery as well. We're using some uh, resources from Heinemann for math on cognitive-based math strategies. We're using um, iReady uh, in some places as well. Uh, we also have been using 95% group materials, so we have kind of a collection of resources we make available to our schools to kind of say, look at your look at your students and decide what you're going to pull from and try and get that buy-in from them. Uh, if you'll email Sharon or myself, either one, I can send you an exhaustive list of different programs that are in place in some way in our district. And Bethany, what I can say is we have our exemplary teachers in those positions as interventionists, and that's the best thing we have. Okay, several people have requested a copy of this PowerPoint, and I'm obviously going to send a copy of the whole webinar, but I don't have the copy. If, they can, if you'll just email me directly, I have it, and I'll be happy to send it off with any other documents you'd like to have. Okay. Um, anyway, it says you said that you had interventionists at, at K-12. Are they all certified teachers? So we don't have it at K-12. No, we already had them I mean, at K-8. K-8. I'm sorry, the question yeah, was K-8. Yeah, K-8 we do. We're, we're, we're redoing some job descriptions. So we had interventionists already in place at the middle school. We, again, just rewrote their job descriptions, and we've worked to identify interventionists at the elementary school as well. Um, we They are certified teachers. We try and say, 
again, we're going to go about what research says, which is our most experienced teachers working with our most at-risk kids. Um, now, I will say you have to have a teacher who wants to work with your most at-risk kids because it's a very taxing job, but we use EAs for support uh, under the guidance, but we do not let our educational assistants run the RTI part of our schools. Right. All right. Um, this was a tremendously, tremendously informative um, webinar. I invite everyone who watches it to please share this webinar with your colleagues. Because Thank you for attending our webinar. I invite you to check out our website, www.proedtn.org, and check out our free educator resources that we update on a monthly basis. Thank you, and please join us for future webinars.